All right, thank you all for tuning in to WJC 98.3 FM, your voice and music, your station. My name is Jeff Badu, and I'm a parallel entrepreneur and a wealth multiplier. I'm the founder and CEO of Badu Enterprises LLC, which is a multinational conglomerate in the finance industry. And today we're here to talk about a very important topic on basically the six reasons why you need to own real estate. Right? The title of the book um, it's called the six reasons why you should own real estate. But today I'll take it as far as the six reasons why you need to own real estate. So ultimately, um, real estate is a game where you have to know what you're doing. Just with anything in life, driving a car, you don't just get out on the street and just drive. You first have to learn, you continuously practice, and then eventually you become an expert when it comes to actually driving um, so that's the same I want you guys to get the same sort of foundation behind it but ultimately once you learn how to get into real estate or once you learn how to invest in real estate it will be a very worthwhile investment so with that being said we're basically um, so I'd like to welcome everyone to the show money talks we're all we talk money and today really we're just going to talk about um, just real estate, right? Six reasons why you should own, why you need to own, why you must own real estate. And ultimately, we're going to kick it off with the market report. Um, just give me one really quick second. Just need a quick second. <clears throat> have to make sure the temperature is right in the room because it's about to get heated um, but let's kick it off with the market report so today's report is as of June 12 2020 so as of last Friday last week began with a bang for stocks as each of the indexes um, essentially gained well over 1% um, for the day so the S&P 500 after climbing 1.2% ultimately has picked up nearly 45%. So get this, nearly 45% um, since its 2020 low and pushing it into, into the black for the year. So basically the S&P 500 actually ended up positive um, or it's, it's basically positive for the year so far. Remember during the COVID-19 and all the madness happened, it essentially fell down a little bit. And so now it's basically up. And by the way, for those tuning in, we're streaming. We're live on the radio today on 98.3 FM. We're also streaming live on Facebook. That's our um, secondary platform. And then we're on Instagram right now, too. So you can tune in on either platforms um, and ultimately get your information. So if you're in, a, in your car right now in Chicago, you can tune in at 98.3 FM. And you can catch me live. Um, you can also chime into my Facebook page and also you can come to my Instagram page. And then last but not least, you can tune into WJCFM.com to catch the information. So the S&P 500 up nearly 45% since its 2020 low, um, pushing it into the black for the year. The NASDAQ rose to a record, a record high while the Dow and the Russell 2000 surged by close to 2.0% each. Oil prices fell marginally and the dollar sank, as did the yield on 10-year treasuries. Investors were encouraged by the prospects of more reopening, so more and more places are reopening. Um, the Federal Reserve's expansion of its mainstream lending program and the growing sentiment that the economy is reversing course toward expansion. Market sectors leading the way include included energy, real estate, airlines, financials, travel and leisure, and retail. Basically, as places are opening up, these are the industries that were pretty high. Um, so if it happens again, now you know which industries you might want to be in. Investors pulled some profits out of the stocks last Tuesday, sending each of the benchmark indexes, except NASDAQ, which is mainly composed of technology stocks, lower. Um, the Dow fell 1.1% and the S&P 500 dipped 
um, it ultimately dipped 0.8 percent. The tech-heavy Nasdaq etched up 0.3 percent and reached 10,000 points for the first time in its history. So, by the way, as everything is in shambles and all that stuff, the Nasdaq just hit its highest point in the history of the stock market, meaning that it's at its highest peak as of last Tuesday in history, only to fall back slightly by the end of the trading. Um, oil prices rose, the yield on 10-year treasuries dropped, and the dollar declined for the ninth straight day. Equities fell again last Wednesday, despite the Fed's announcement that it would maintain the current price target or target rate range of 0.0%. To 0.25%. Um, so basically, they promised that they would leave interest rates at 0% for quite some time, at least a year or two. Um, and then continue to make asset purchases at the current pace. The Dow dropped 1.0%. The SP 500 lost 0.5%. But the NASDAQ continued to climb, gaining 0.7%. For the first time in several sessions, Fangs, aka Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Alphabet or Google posted gains, although, um, I'm sorry, posted gains along with healthcare and tech stocks. Stocks plunged dramatically. So last Thursday was a, I mean, it was, it was crazy, crazy low. It was a great time to buy. Remember, when the stock market is down, that's the time to buy, not the time to sell. When the stock market is up, that's the time to sell. People sort of get that thing confused. They buy when it's high and then they sell when it's low. It's not supposed to be like that. It's buy low, sell high. Always remember the rules. If you remember the rules and you play by the rules, you will probably win the game. Um, so ultimately, stocks plunged dramatically last Thursday as investors sold stocks. So remember, the stock market is all supply and demand. People are buying and then people are selling. So on Thursday, investors started panicking um, and basically because they heard some bad news. So they started selling like crazy, So which reduced the demand of the stock market, which ultimately reduced the price. It's all supply and demand. The stock market is nothing more than that. Is If things are looking good, there's high demand, so stock prices will go up. If things are looking bad, there's low demand, so stock prices will go down. What does that mean? It means don't panic when the bad times come. As with anything in life, you must stick around when there's bad and you must stick around when there's good. Um, it's really a test to see who's in it for the long run and who's in it just to, just for the short run. It's like a relationship, if you think about it. It's like who's there when times are really tough, when times are really hard, when that spouse loses their job, when something happens. Um, what do you do? Do you just leave the relationship, right? Do you just demonstrate weak stamina and just leave the relationship? Or do you stick it out and ultimately understand that there's better times ahead? It's the same fundamental and psychological game here in the stock market in that the market will go up always, no matter what. The stock market will always, always, always go up. If you look at a historical chart, a 100-year chart for that matter, if you looked at the historical chart, you can tell that the market is only trended one way, which is upwards. So what that means is that the market will continue going up and even through COVID-19, the stock market is still going up, which is crazy. Unemployment is at possibly the highest it's ever been in history and the stock market is still at its peak, crazy. Now what would happen if unemployment actually went down tremendously? That means that stock prices will continuously go up um, so one thing to always note, the stock market will always go up. It might drop for a little bit from time to time, but over the long run, just like a relationship, things will eventually come back to normal unless it's just not meant to be. Then ultimately, things will go back. Things will, will go back to, um, not necessarily even a new normal, but things will go back good, essentially. Um, so that's basically what happened. So stocks post a solid... I'm sorry, let's go back to Thursday. So investors started selling stocks on news that rising COVID-19 cases, um, coupled with the Federal Reserve's assessment that the economy was slow to recover. So basically, 
what happened with investors is that um, COVID-19 cases started going up in states like Florida, Texas, basically the states that reopened, in my opinion, too early. And they didn't impose really any restrictions on people as far as mask wearing and things with social distancing. I mean, it was saw, it was um, shown on TV, but I don't believe it was necessarily enforced um, saying, hey, you can't necessarily go somewhere or go in a grocery store without a mask. People were just freely doing whatever they wanted. And of course, this case has spiked up back into the thousands um, on a daily, I believe, basis or so. And ultimately, Texas is about to, and from what I've heard at least, is about to shut down again after reopening. So basically, they call this the second wave, apparently. Um, they're saying that more and more states will experience a second wave. I mean, in my opinion, we're still, I mean, a wave is a wave. So basically, you just have to be careful. And when it comes to money, understand the fundamentals of money that the market will go back up no matter what. The markets will rise, the markets will go back up. There's no need to really panic, per se. I mean, you might get shocked and you might get a little emotional, but no need to do that for the long run. Just stay the course, and ultimately the market will go back up. Take advantage of opportunities, though. If you hear news that, hey, pharmaceutical stocks will probably rise over the next three months, then you need to get into pharmaceutical stocks. Right? The moment that the trend dies down, then you sell. You get out, you make your money, you get out, you sell. So you could do some short-term trading in a time like this, uh, which is what I personally do from time to time as well. But ultimately, um, each of the benchmark indexes fell by at least 5.27%. So all those gains we had pretty much went downhill, with the Russell 2000 dropping 7.58% and the Dow plummeting 6.90%. Yields on a 10-year treasury sank, as did the quite, um, crude oil prices. Equities rallied from Thursday's route, but not enough to prevent an overall week of losses. Stocks posted solid returns last Friday, which each, with each of the benchmark indexes posting solid daily gains, led by the Russell 2000, which climbed more than 2.5%, or I'm sorry, 2.25%, and on the day, and then crude oil prices inched up as did the yields on 10-year treasuries. However, the week was marked by fears of a second virus wave, which sent equities into a tailspin. Uh, while stocks rallied Friday, the major indexes lost ground for the week. The small caps of the Russell 2000 were hit the hardest, followed by the, the Dow, Global Dow, S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. Year-to-date, only the NASDAQ, which is composed of and technology stocks where you have to be remain solidly in the black while the Russell 2000, the global Dow, and the Dow continue to lag by more than 10% um, respectively. Investors exercise caution in light of rising COVID-19 infection rates and an uncertain economic outlook. So basically what happened? Why did the stock market go down last week? One COVID-19 cases um, rose in some some states such as Texas and Florida. Um, so investors got scared that maybe we'll go through another big wave of unemployment. Um, and then also the Federal Reserve came out and said, wow, this thing is looking wor way worse than what we expected. Of course, when Jerome Powell, the head of the Federal Reserve, comes out and says that, I mean, investors just panic. They pull their hair out. Um, it's crazy. It's crazy how people's emotions are really tied to the stock market like that. It's, it's not really that, that type of game. Um, it's looked at like that where prices are going up. It's like your, your emotions are going up and down, but it's not. You have to look at it from a long-term perspective. There are some stocks, there are certain investments that you can be in, kick back, relax, and just ride the wave, basically. <clears throat> so the price of crude oil went down 39.16 per barrel to 36.41. Um, Price of Comax Gold went up from 1688.30 per ounce to 1738.40 per ounce. So far this year, the Dow Jones is down 10.28%. NASDAQ, composed of technology stocks, is up 6.87%. S&P 500 is down 5.86%. Russell 2000 is down 16.83%. 
Global Dow was down 13.89%. Federal funds rate or the interest rates are still at 0%. And 10 year um, treasuries are at a mere measly 0.69%. So, what's to expect this week? Can we make some predictions? Maybe we can. Who knows? This week in relatively, is relatively slow with respect to market moving economic reports. However, one entry that bears watching is the Federal Reserve's report on industrial production for May. April saw overall production regress by 11.2% and manufacturing fall 13.7%. With partial easing of COVID-19 related restrictions, May's production numbers should be better. So it should be better, but I still believe that we'll see an overall downturn as far as those numbers are concerned. So remember, a few lessons learned with that report. Stay the course. There's no need to panic. Take advantage where you can. I'm telling you, there's so much news out there that you can leverage on. I mean, with all these COVID-19 um, vaccines that are expected to come out in the near future, um, you can get in on that and start investing in some of these pharmaceutical companies, even if it's only for the short term. So now let's talk about six reasons why you need to get real estate. If you don't have it, these are the six reasons why you need to get it. If you have it, these are the six reasons why you need more of it. So believe it or not, most millionaires are actually created through real estate. And it's a, it's a well-known fact that nine out of 10 millionaires essentially got there uh, by owning real estate or by acquiring or investing into real estate. Now, when we're talking real estate, we're only talking here about buying and holding. So we're talking about rental real estate. We're not talking about flipping. We're not talking about wholesaling. Those nine out of 10 millionaires, we're not talking about wholesalers. Those nine out of 10 millionaires, we're not talking about flippers. We're talking about people who want to invest. When you invest in something, you're holding it for a fairly decent amount of time. When you're flipping, it's a job, basically. When you're wholesaling, it's a job. It's something that you consistently have to do over and over again. So when we talk nine out of 10 millionaires, we're talking about investing, like actually holding the real estate property. Um, I can tell you right now that I'm a real estate investor. I invest in real estate. I personally invest in real estate. I'll give you a hint or in some insight. I just looked at a 26 unit um, building today that we're, we're thinking about acquiring that my, my company, my investment company is thinking about acquiring. Um, I love real estate. Some people are like, oh, COVID-19 happened. Uh, we're about to be in a recession, which is a well-known fact. Um, as of the end of this month, we will be in an official recession. Um, and people are like, why buy real estate when things are looking bad? And I'm like, it's the same thing, like a relationship, like the stock market. Why are you getting out of something when things, all of a sudden, when things go bad? That's not the way that you should be investing. You should be investing for the long run. You should be investing from a long-term outlook. So for me, the fact that we're in COVID-19 doesn't really mean a whole lot to me. It just means that I need to take advantage of more opportunities and I need to be a bit more careful. Meaning I screen tenants a little bit more. Uh, meaning that we ultimately just, we just have to make smarter decisions. Not that we're making dumb decisions in the past, but we just need to be a little bit more cautious in what we do. And I'll be the first to say that as of today, we haven't missed a single rent payment from a tenant, knock on wood. Not a single tenant has missed rent as far as payments are concerned. Not a single one. We've got payments from every single tenant. And the reason why is because we implement certain principles. We implement certain things. So when people say, oh yeah, there's a recession here, so you're about to lose everything. That's just people speaking from their gut. That's just people speaking from bad experience. So ultimately, when it comes to investing, when it comes to anything in life, religion, relationships, investments, um, your business, whatever it is, you have to be in it for the long run. If you can't stick if you can't get through the bad times, then you won't, you won't, basically you won't survive. So you have to be prepared for the bad times and you have to be prepared for the good times. Not every day will be all peachy and rainy. I mean, not every day will be a beautiful day where you're out on the beach and you're cruising and everybody's traveling. You'll have days like this sometimes where you have COVID-19. Not only that, 
you have riots, looting, and all types of crazy stuff going on in the world today. It's still time to thrive. It's still time to be prosperous. You just have to make sure that you stay the course and you educate yourself when it comes to these topics. So today I'm just here to provide you, it's not a how-to or a get-rich-quick scheme or anything like that. I'm just giving you reasons. That's the sole purpose of today. I'm giving you six reasons why you shouldn't, why you need to own real estate. That's all we're doing today. We're not talking about how do you flip properties or how do you buy a rental properties. No, that's not the segment today. We've already talked about that segment in the past and we'll talk about it more in the future. Today we're talking about the six reasons why you need to own real estate. And full disclosure, I wrote a book on this called The Legendary Asset, Six Reasons Why You Should Own Real Estate, which can be purchased on my website, jeffbaidu.com. Of course, when the book came out, closed mouths don't get fed. Those who are hungry, first in line, eats first. Those who reached out to me got a free copy of the book, but now it's on sale on my website, jeffbaidu.com. Um, and so ultimately, real estate is... As a real estate investor, as somebody who's invested for for many years, um, real estate provides some tremendous benefits that no other asset can really handle or provide. So I would say that ultimately, I love real estate. This is coming from somebody who's very careful, somebody who's a financial expert. I've seen all investments in the world, and I love different types of investments. I love life insurance. I love traditional businesses. I love stocks. Um, I love car rentals. And I love real estate. I've, I've seen a lot of different asset classes, but I have never seen one that is as powerful as real estate. And I talk about what that means. So although it can have its ups and downs, like right now we're, we're pretty down, we're relatively. Some landlords you talk to are like, yeah, some of my tenants haven't paid rent. And I'll be the first to say, knock on wood, remember, we haven't missed, we haven't had a tenant miss rent. Like a single, on, as of today, if you looked at our income and expense report, not a single tenant has actually missed a rent payment. Every tenant is showing us paid, right? And we have certain principles. I'll give you one hint. We collect two months rent up front on every tenant. We collect a minimum of two months, first and last month's rent up front. That way, we know that the average person has $400, less than $400 in the bank account. So off the bat, we know if we don't charge more than one month, we might be in trouble during a time like this. So we've already gotten two months up front, meaning that if the tenant doesn't have enough money saved in the bank or maybe misses one month, well, guess what? We already got the other month. So they're good. That allows them time to catch up, maybe get some unemployment benefits. And here's another thing we do. We educate our tenants. We have a business relationship with our tenants. Every tenant, the property manager knows them and says, hey, if you need anything, just let me know. If you have trouble paying rent, let me know. Anybody, of course, on Section 8, payment is not really a problem because it comes from the government. Uh, but we educate them and say, hey, if you take good care of your property or, or this building, you'll keep your Section 8 voucher. If you don't, you won't. It's very simple. We educate them. We send them webinars. We send them articles. We send them stuff that continuously educates them. I'll give you one example. We did have a tenant um, about a month ago that was having some trouble. This tenant, we had already collected her two months, but she was having trouble paying rent for a month. I believe it was April. And the Salvation Army actually has a program now where they'll supplement somebody's rent on a month-to-month -month basis. We found out about the program. We sent her the application. She filled it out, and guess what? In a few weeks, we got a check in the mail for $1,200. We got a check in the mail. And so just by us educating the tenant on, hey, there's free rent money that's out there, all you have to do is submit an application. This tenant was able to do it. She paid. Now she's collecting her unemployment benefits, her $600 per week which we also told her about that, that the unemployment has been boosted because she lost her job. And now she has $600 a month. And guess who's the first person she'll think about paying when when uh, when her bills are pretty much due? Her housing, of course. The roof that's over her head. I mean, 
you can't really be a stickler or mean person to your tenants. You have to treat them as if they're human beings, as if this is a business relationship that you have with the person, similar to the way that you treat t um, clients or anything like that. You have to truly, truly, truly be in it for the best interest of everybody. Because remember, you got into real estate not just to make money, but to provide housing, stable housing for people. If there's a maintenance issue, they simply fill out the maintenance form. Right, which you should all have one if you're in real estate. And ultimately, once they fill out the form, we let them know that, hey, we can complete this within X amount of days, and we're good. So understand that real estate has its ups and downs. It's not every day that would be peachy. Um, and you must have reserves, must. You need at least three months of mortgage payments in the bank. Without a doubt, you need to have reserves. If you don't have reserves, you're gonna get burned. Trust me. As a matter of fact, you can't even buy a house, at least through a traditional lender, if you don't have any reserves that's showing in, in your bank. So the reserve, reserves are basically cash in your bank that's enough to cover at least minimum three months of the mortgage payments. If you don't have it, then it might be a problem because what happens when a tenant stops paying? All right? Unlike our case, what happens when a tenant does decide, hey, I don't want to pay you? Well, now what the tenant can do, or basically, if you don't have reserves, you might get into a foreclosure situation, right? So ultimately, that is is something that we need to watch out for. But let's talk about the, the six reasons, because I did promise that today we'll talk about six reasons why you should own real estate. So let's talk about reason one. Reason one is cash flow. Number one reason why we buy real estate is because it, it produces income. So we have a business, or in our case, the Badu Enterprises has about 13 different, I'm sorry, 12 different businesses, one of them being our foundation. So with that, we have multiple streams of income. However, the more, the merrier. When it comes to money, more is better, right? So basically, what we say is we want cash flow. We want money to be coming in just in case, hey, what if the tax returns slow down a little bit? What if the um, what if tenants stop stop paying? Or what if other businesses go bad? What if this COVID-19 shut down? I mean, it didn't necessarily shut down our car rental business, but it slowed it down just a little bit. And that's only one segment because we've segmented the car rental business into... Um, short-term rentals and then long-term rentals so the short-term rental side has slowed down a little bit and even our Airbnb business on our real estate side slowed down just a little bit so that's why you have to be diversified in your income streams because when one slows down one picks up if you're doing this if you if you're diversifying your income streams you will never have a single problem ever a day in your life because when one is down one is up the one that's up basically holds down the one that's down or ultimately brings it back up. And now guess what? They have stimulus programs. They have the stimulus check. Um, they have the, um, the rental assistance programs. They have the PPP paycheck protection program. The SBA has rental, the SBA in addition to the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army doesn't want people to go homeless. So they have a rental assistance program. So for anybody who's fearing, oh, what if in a bad time, things go bad well guess what that that's naturally what happens but when you have an optimistic perspective of life when you're taking advantage of resources things won't be as bad trust we're not we're not panicking right now due to COVID-19 not at all we're picked our business has picked up tremendously because we're taking advantage of opportunities and we're consistently educating ourselves on these different resources but real estate provides cash flow an opportunity to build long-term wealth and increase your cash flow so let's say, um, let's say you have a building and you can collect $1,500 per month and your mortgage, your utilities, your property taxes and all that. Typically, landlords don't pay utilities outside of water. Um, but let's say all of that is 1000 per month. Well, now you're cash flowing $500 per month. So your income minus your expenses equals $500 per month. This is how we start in real estate with a single family home that was netting about 500 bucks on a monthly basis. On a minimum, we try to aim for about $400 per month. But hey, 
Um, even if it's 300, sometimes we'll still do the deal. And of course, nowadays we're doing multiple units. We're doing multiple streams of income on one single building. So even if it's $500 a month extra cash, that's $500 a month of extra cash that you wouldn't have had had you not had this property. And I'll teach you about leverage in a second, but that's $500 extra cash that you can create with little to none of your own money in the first place. That's the beauty of it. Best of all, it's money you don't even have to work for. For us, we have property managers. We do not manage our own properties necessarily, like on, a, on an intense basis. Now, we might provide some assistance with certain things, but we don't physically actually manage every single property that we own. Um, so basically, the reason why I said it's money you don't have to work for is because you have a property manager that's on site. You pay them about 8 to 10%. Please make sure you pick the right property manager, one who's dedicated, honest, and one who pays attention to detail. Get a good property manager that can ultimately manage your properties for you so that you don't have to deal with tenant calls at night and all that. Um, for me, I sleep pretty good at night. We do have a lot of tenants, but basically none of which call me personally. Um, as a matter of fact, none of them, not a single tenant has my direct phone number. The, I mean, at a bare minimum, bare minimum, I would say, um, they basically, they all they have access to is a Google Voice line. For me, if, if they, for whatever reason, they need to reach me as the owner, for whatever reason, then there's a Google Voice line that they can reach out to. But when you have a property manager, let them know that, hey, this is your primary point of contact. As a matter of fact, if you have a manager, I would, I would not even give the tenant, um, the owner's contact information. This is maybe if you've passed on the ownership or I'm sorry, the management to a management company. So off the bat, make sure you get a management company that you can trust. I see a lot of real estate investors get burnt because they think this is a passive business when you're managing your own property, especially if you have a multifamily. They get busy at their full-time jobs. The tenants stop paying. They, they stop paying for one month. Well, okay, it happens. They stop paying for two months. Next thing you know, they have to evict knock on wood we have never had to evict a tenant in the history of owning our real estate knock on wood of course because we have strict management policies in place you have very very strict management not not to say we're sticklers or anything like that but we're strict when it comes to certain things we're strict when it comes to the two months advance we're strict with the background checks if we see an eviction i mean you have you had you had a, a you had better had a very good reason as to why you were evicted. All right, so ultimately you have to you have to be careful in this game. Very, very be careful. Um, so it's money you don't necessarily have to work for. That's the beauty of it. Like you can literally sit back, kick, relax, always check in on a property manager, but you don't have to physically be there. Basically, just do a monthly check in on your property manager and say, "Hey, how are the tenants doing? Do you need anything from me?" anything that needs to be fixed any payments um, just check in on them just just casually check in on them it's very very good practice um, and just letting the property manager know that hey I'm here for you if you need me and then the tenants know that the property manager is there for them if they need them the reason why things go bad in south is because there's there's no lack I mean people basically there's a lack of attention to detail on some of this stuff so you do have to be careful in this game um, but this allows you the opportunity to have massive passive income. Now, leverage income, money that you make off of other people's efforts, is the best form of income on the planet. However, passive income, money that you make off of an investment, is the second best income, and it's money you don't have to work for. I'm proud today to say that I am retired, meaning I don't have to work another day. I don't have to physically get out and work another day in my life and I would still be financially stable. To me, that means a lot, right? In that I've built, I've built the empire to the point where I don't physically have to work anymore if I chose not to. Now, of course, I still do, and, and that's because God has given me the ability to still work. However, if I chose to kick back, relax, check in on a property manager once a month, and check in on the businesses, see how they're doing, I would be good right? because I've put in enough work. I've put in the time and the energy and the effort up front 
to the point where I don't have to work another day in my life ever again for the rest of my life. And to me, that means a lot. However, I'm not slowing down, of course. Just because I have the option to work doesn't mean I'm not going to work. I'm 27 years old. I'm fully willing and able to work. And so I choose to work. Now, I don't put in crazy hours or anything like that. I still get eight hours of sleep every single night. We do operate 12 different businesses now, including the Badu Foundation, um, across multiple entities. However, I'm still the CEO of the company. And so I need to make sure the business is doing what it's supposed to do and that people have what they need ultimately to get to achieve our goal of an abundant community. Um, so that's number one is cash flow. The number one reason why we invest in real estate is to give us more money into our bank accounts every single month. Every month on the first of every month, we get a check or we get multiple checks. We get checks from lots and lots of tenants every single month on the first of the month. If we don't get it by the fifth of the month, we send out an eviction notice. That's how strict we are. If we don't get your payment by the fifth, we're gonna send you a notice saying, hey, you know, uh, where's the money? Um, that's basically an eviction notice. And so, um, and now keep in mind with COVID-19, there are some limitations on eviction, so be very careful with that. Um, so technically we can't, we can't really send out notices right now. However, we just send a text to the tenant saying, hey, do you need any help? Just re don't say, hey, where's the money? Say, do you need any help with anything? And you'll be surprised how much they'll open up to you and say, hey, I just lost my job or something happened. Um, not saying accept excuses, but just hear them out a little bit and then ultimately work out some sort of um, payment structure. Because remember, the Salvation Army right now has a rental assistance program where they'll supplement your tenant's rent um, for you because the Salvation Army doesn't want anybody to go homeless. Um, and we actually partner with the Salvation Army, so that's how we know about this resource as well. Number two is mortgage pay down by your tenants. As you're basically... So when you buy a house, you typically buy it with a mortgage. We don't ever buy a house cash. Anybody that tells you buy a house cash is lying to you. Don't ever buy a house with cash because basically you're losing money at that point. You can be using the bank's money to basically attain that cash flow, that wealth, building that wealth. But it gets even sweeter. As the tenant is paying you rent or as your tenants in a multifamily situation, as the tenants are paying you rent, Part of that money is going towards your mortgage. What that means is that basically the tenant is helping you build equity. Equity is basically if you sell the building, how much cash will be in your bank account. That's the definition of equity. Um, basically, every single month as the tenant is paying you, you're applying a certain portion to the principal of the mortgage. So in some people's analysis, they're like, oh, I'll just make $300 a month. Well, you have to be careful. Because you're not just making $300 per month, you're increasing your equity in the property as well. So just because it's $300 a month, um, it might not look so attractive, but over the long run, over a 15 to 30 year time span, it looks very attractive. Essentially, the tenant is helping you build equity in the property, which helps you build equity on your own. It increases your net worth. Once you build up a fairly substantial amount of equity, you can get what's called a home equity line of credit or refinance or do a cash out refinance um, basically to acquire more properties. So the reason why we're able to buy an infinite amount of properties is because we have equity built in within, within these properties over a between a three to five year time span we can take the property, the equity we have, and get what's called a HELOC or home equity line of credit, or we can do a cash out refinance and basically pull out that equity so that we can buy, guess what, another property. What do we use as a down payment? The money that we have um, basically from that refinance. So instead of going to Vegas, playing black, or going out to the Gucci stores and the malls and all that stuff, um, we buy more properties. And you might be wondering, when do we stop? We never stop. We're infinite. We're infinitely expanding every single day. We don't stop when it comes to wealth building because there are people that we need to pass this down from generation to generation. And those people will also pass it down from generation to generation. You might be wondering why some communities might not be thriving, especially during a time like COVID-19. 
is because of the wealth. The wealth is lacking, basically. So when it comes to wealth, it's something that you get and you multiply it over time. And ultimately, over time, you pass it down from generation to generation. Um, so we got about, say, about 10 more minutes here. Let's cover some more benefits. The third one is tax benefits. Of course, my personal favorite um, as, a, as a tax professional that I am. Won't get too deep into the weeds of it, but real estate, when you own real estate, you don't pay any taxes, income taxes at least. If you own a property today and you are paying income taxes, there's a problem. It means that you're not doing effective or good tax planning. Now, if you have reasons for showing the profit, then I mean, that those could be your reasons. Ultimately, we don't pay taxes on our real estate. Why? Because we get to deduct all expenses either directly tied to the property or indirectly tied to the property. So we can deduct expenses such as repairs and maintenance, insurance, property taxes, mortgage interest that your tenant is paying for, by the way. Um, so your tenant is paying for it, but we're getting to deduct it. You can deduct any travel to the rental. You can deduct any meals that you have with tenants or prospect tenants or prospect investors or prospect partners, which AKA is the, in the entire world, by the way. Um, you can take business trips down to Vegas, Florida, Philippines, Bahamas. Um, this is an opportunity for you to actually have a business um, because it's real estate. Real, every building that we own is in its own LLC, limited liability company. We treat every building as if we bought a new business. And so we separate out the business functions. Every time I travel, I went to Jamaica at the end of last year. That was my board meeting for the year. My company paid for it, so that was a tax deduction, even though I got to enjoy about 75% of the trip. So ultimately, you can do some of these things when it comes to taxes. And then the biggest D word on the planet is depreciation. I call this magic. Right? It's money that you don't really see leave your bank account, but it leaves your taxes. Um, as far as taxable income is concerned. So you can depreciate. Some people get confused with this. Properties do appreciate, which we'll talk about in a second. But you can depreciate your property while your property in reality is appreciating. Sounds strange, but you can depreciate residential real estate over a 27 and a half year useful life and 39 years for commercial property. And in some cases, we can even accelerate this depreciation through what's called cost segregation, which a lot of my clients use to this day. That's a big tax planning tool that we use. But basically, if you own a building that you bought it for 100000 all in, you simply take $100,000 divided by 27.5, and that's your deduction, your automatic tax write-off for the next 27 and a half years. And remember, in some cases, we can accelerate up to 50% of that in the first year especially if you're a real estate agent or somebody who's called a real estate professional. Um, this can be huge. This can be huge. You will not pay a single dime or a penny in taxes when it comes to real estate if you do this the right way. You can be cash flowing. You can own 100 plus units and not pay a single penny in taxes if you're strategizing. My average, Over 90% of my real estate clients do not pay any taxes on their real estate. Um, so depreciation is simply the process where you're ultimately writing off the cost of the property over what it's called its useful life. Now this building can last 100 years, right? So this allows many people to declare a loss um, or break even on paper on a tax return when in reality they're actually making a profit. Depreciation ultimately helps you reduce your taxable income. And if you're working with a good lender, if you need one, let me know. They'll add back. Here's where it gets even more beautiful. You might be like, well, I'm wiping out all my income. I can't get a qualify for mortgages. Well, guess what? They'll add back depreciation to your income because they know that depreciation is not a real expense. It's simply, it's simply um, what you've invested. And remember, this is true even if you only put down 1% on a building. So let's say you bought a building and you only put down 1000 You can still take that $100,000 deduction over 27 and a half years. Same thing with the car, same thing with anything that's a depreciable asset. It's a beautiful deduction. I mean, it's the most powerful D word on the planet. Um, but remember, you can use more advanced depreciation techniques such as cost segregation, which helps you accelerate your depreciation deduction by stripping out 
aka stripping out certain components of the property on your tax return such as appliances fixtures the roof things of that nature and then you can do and let's say it's time to sell your real estate well you can sell it tax-free through things such as 1031 exchanges self-directed IRAs um, you can also utilize opportunity zones so you can ultimately enjoy tax-free wealth by utilizing these advanced techniques um, which is 1031 exchange is simply trading one property for another um, and then also when it comes to self-directed IRAs there are some strict rules when it comes to that right you can you can have your IRA so just like you have a 401k or IRA or even a health savings account or HSA you can have your IRA or HSA own an LLC invest into an LLC that you own basically um, and you go out and buy properties on a tax-free basis this is more on the advanced side. Remember, today we're trying trying to keep it basic. But this allows you to build wealth tax-free, especially if you utilize a Roth IRA. Very strict rules here, as well as um, regarding prohibited parties and transactions, which are way beyond the scope of this presentation. But there are hundreds of tax benefits. The tax code was created for the business owner and the real estate investor. You can truly avoid paying taxes by owning real estate. This is a very powerful powerful tool right here so on top of the cash flow on top of the tenant payment of mortgage um, or pay down of the, your mortgage you can also gain some tax benefits next is appreciation which is why some people get into real estate to begin with I'm like yeah it's nice appreciation I call it I call it cherry on top we don't buy properties just because of appreciation we know that it's going to appreciate but we don't care about appreciation it's nice and we can we can get more loans and all that good stuff with the appreciation but that's not why we buy real estate. We buy real estate because we want money in our bank accounts. That's a mistake a lot of investors make. They buy first for appreciation, and then when the market tanks, they lose all their money. Um, real estate is an asset class that has appreciated fairly consistently over time, about 6% or so on average. Um, and appreciate, appreciate the summaries, by the way, Leslie. Definitely appreciate that. Um, you can literally sit on your couch while watching your property appreciate. That is true. You can sit on your couch and make money just like the stock market. Appreciation should not be the main reason why you acquire a property. However, it is a pretty nice benefit. We call it cherry on top. And all of that appreciation goes to you, not the bank. Right? You can put down 1% on a building where the bank puts in 99% and you still keep all the appreciation. I mean, if you tell me an investment on the planet that can do the same, I'll give you a reward for that. But all of that appreciation goes to you even if you put no money down into the property. There are no money down deals, although it's not likely in this environment. Um, so we you typically have to put down at, at a minimum 3.5% utilizing the FHA loan, Federal Housing Administration loan, which of course we talked about on another segment. Now we got about three or so minutes here. Um, Number five is leverage. This right here is powerful. I mean, not to say that none of these other things are powerful, but this right here is extremely powerful. Leverage is simply the ability to buy more with less of your own money. It's where you can do the 1% down payment, 3.5% down payment. You have the ability to buy plenty of real estate with little to none of your own money. We started buying buildings in 2016. We bought our first building in 2016. And this year, we'll own almost over 50 units by the end of this year. So with that being said, we didn't have to use a whole lot of our money. We had to get educated. We had to take advantage of resources. And we, we, we had to put in some sweat equity. We had to put in some time and energy to actually get to where we are today. Um, when, we, when I say we, I mean myself and my enterprise, the Badu Enterprises and the Badu Investments brand. But basically, you have the ability to buy plenty of real estate with little to none of your own money tied into the deal. The reason is because the loan is secured by the property, so there's very minimal risk to the lender. If you run and go to Vegas, the lender takes back the building. So with that being said, they'll give you money all day, every day to buy real estate. In the stock market, you can't really do such a thing, although you can use some leverage in the stock market usually have to put down 20 percent or so on a property nowadays it's about 25 to 35 percent but savvy investors know how to acquire real estate with no little to no money down 
by using sources such as business credit cards and business lines of credit and also refinancing and HELOCs, home equity lines of credit. There's truly no limit to how many properties one can buy if you know how to find good deals and have some gap reserve funds available. Remember, reserve, reserves, reserves. Reserves are very important in a time like this. A bank will not give you money unless you can show some money in the bank because they know some tenants might not want to pay. So they'll require you. Some banks are very good in that they'll actually vet the deal for you and make sure that it's a good deal before they put in their 75%, 75 to 96.5%. Um, um, so it's very powerful. It's very, very powerful. And for those that don't think you can do FHA loans, we just did one two months ago. Um, so it's, it's very important to be resourceful in a time like this. Last but not least, longevity. Real estate will always be here. With all the robots and everything coming out, real estate will always, always, always be here. You're more than likely standing or sitting on real estate as you listen to this presentation tonight. Meaning that real estate is a hot commodity. It will always be here. No matter how many robots come to the planet, they'll need a place to stay eventually, right? So it's very, very important this is an industry that will be here forever, which is a big reason why you need to own it. Real estate will be here forever. Longevity is very, 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 very important. So that's it for the segment tonight. If you guys want to find out more information, please reach out to me, 773-679-7198. Once again, 773-679-7198. The website is chefbadu.com where we supply you with tons and tons of resources. Um, and then also you can email me at jeffbadu at gmail.com. And so remember, real estate is a very powerful asset to own. There's six reasons why you need to own it. First reason being cash flow. Second reason being um, tenant pay down of your mortgage. Third reason being tax benefits. Fourth reason essentially being the fact that real estate appreciates. Fifth reason is leverage, the ability to buy less or more. I'm sorry, the ability to buy more with less. Um, and then last but not least, longevity. The fact that real estate will always be here. So thank you all for tuning in to WGHC 98.3 FM, your voice, your music, your station. My name is Jeff Badu, and I look forward to continuously delivering you all some content. Thank you.